Good morning and welcome to Rising. We have a great show for you today. I'm Amber Duke, joined by Nomiki Kantz. Nomiki, good to see you as always. One week, a little over one week. Just uh, slowly getting there. And we make it through the tensions. Oh, <laughs> God. Well, we are nearly a week out from the 2024 presidential election, and you can feel those tensions rising. While Kamala Harris campaigned in Pennsylvania, former President Donald Trump held a rally in Madison Square Garden in New York City. He largely stuck to his usual talking points, but his guests made indisputable racist remarks. Here's Trump doubling down on his enemy within rhetoric. Let's watch. I know many of them. It's just this amorphous group of people. But they're smart and they're vicious, and we have to defeat them. And when I say the enemy from within, the other side goes crazy, becomes a sound. Oh, how can he say? No, they've done very bad things to this country. They are indeed the enemy from within. And, but this is who we're fighting. These are the people who are doing such harm to our country with their open border policies. And here's comedian Tony Hinchcliffe, the host of the show Kill Tony. Let's watch. I welcome migrants to the United States of America with open arms. And by open arms, I mean like this. <laughs> it's wild. And these Latinos, they love making babies too. Just know that. They do. They do. There's no pulling out. They don't do that. They come inside, just like they did to our country. <laughs> Republicans are the party with a good sense of humor. But it didn't stop there. He also called Puerto Rico a, quote, floating island of garbage, to which Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said on X, quote, this isn't the comedy store. You're using your set to boost neo-Nazis like Marjorie Taylor Greene and stripping women's rights to the Stone Age. Your sense of humor doesn't change that. It wasn't just AOC comparing Trump's rally to a Nazi rally. Think Tank director Alexander Vindman wrote on X, quote, I've resisted calling Trump a MAGA fascist, mainly because I've understood fascism and Nazism as almost incomprehensible evil. But the reality is MAGA is today who the Nazis were before they seized power. There is no better historical comparison to MAGA than the Nazis of the early 1930s. The Nation journalist Ali Mistal wrote, it could not be more on brand for the Republican Party right now than to invite a racist comedian to their Nazi rally, claim that all the racism is jokes, then fiend offense at, your, at you pointing out their racism and calling their event a Nazi rally. Or take a look at how MSNBC covered the event. But that jamboree happening right now, you see it there on your screen, in that place is particularly chilling because in 1939, more than 20,000 supporters of a different fascist leader, Adolf Hitler, packed the garden for a so-called pro-America rally. So, uh, 1939, there was a Nazi rally, a U.S. Nazi Party rally held at Ma uh, Madison Square Garden. In 1968, George Wallace hel held a rally there. There was a lot of lead up to this rally. The Trump campaign didn't know whether or not they were going to have it. The public, you know, outrage started months in advance uh, of this rally, and they still had it. And uh, it seems like they didn't screen their comments uh, closely enough because... Those, those, those comments that have been going viral um, from, from obviously this comedian to Tucker Carlson uh, to even Dr. Phil. I mean, do you think that this helped the Trump campaign? I suppose I don't understand the comparison to the 1939 rally because Madison Square Garden has long been an event venue for people of all stripes. This is a place where Bill Clinton accepted the Democratic nomination mm -hmm. at the DNC. This is a place that has the most performances by Billy Joel and before that Elton John. So what is the what is the why is the 1939 rally the point of comparison and not any of these other events that have taken place at Madison Square Garden? Because by that logic, you would have to accuse Bill Clinton of hearkening back to the Nazi rally, no? Well, I think the difference is the rhetoric. <laughs> the rhetoric being said, it was a lot of white nationalist rhetoric, uh, indisputable racist rhetoric. Even the, Don the Trump campaign had to distance themselves from uh, this comedian because of what they said about Puerto Ricans. And, and, and we'll talk about this later on the show, but that is a significant voting population, specifically in Pennsylvania, but also in Florida, where former Governor Rick Scott came out speaking against 
the comments. I mean, it wasn't a good look. There was indisputable racism. I mean, Tucker Carlson was talking about race replacement theory. Uh, you know, there were white supremacist undertones and overtones, frankly, um, being stated where, yes, the DNC was held in New York and Madison Square Garden is one of the large venues, but that was, you know, in the 90s and it was not the same rhetoric. Usually, it is concerts. I mean, that's the majority of what happens is sports and concerts at M MSG. Uh, it was also interesting just because this is not a state that Donald Trump is vying to win. And, and, but it was shocking because his lawyer went on stage and said that they were going to flip New York blue, which is, you know, just crazy town at this point to even say that. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm curious why they would choose that, that venue when there are so many places around the country they could have chosen, so many uh, swing districts. I mean, even if you didn't want to focus on one uh, state that was a swing state, maybe a swing district to prove a point. I just don't understand why he chose New York. Because Madison Square Garden is an iconic venue. He is from New York originally. This was supposed to be a symbol of him sort of returning back to his home and showing how far he's come since then. And it obviously was intended to get a lot of earned media. Now, it's obviously unfortunate that the earned media that mostly has come out of it was based on this comedian's joke. And I do think it is a little bit dishonest to try to paint the entirety of the rally uh, after the joke of one comedian who is a roast insult comic and who hosts a very popular show who regularly has millions of views on the program. I think most people understand that comedians have a little bit more leeway with the comments that they make. And George Lopez recently at a Kamala Harris rally made fun of Mexicans, suggesting that if construction materials for the border wall were left out, that the Mexicans would go and steal them. So it's a good thing Trump stopped building the wall. Um, and you also had uh, had Kamala Harris herself making fun of white people, saying they don't season their tacos or whatever it is. So yes, I just I think, I think a little bit of a difference between calling an island, you know, garbage, an island that's been well, ravaged. I mean, the other side of this is is folks who've been displaced from Puerto Rico because of Donald Trump's inaction during Hurricane Maria. We can't forget that famous uh, paper towel throwing that he did when he showed up late to the island and how many folks had to leave because their homes were completely wrecked and that they weren't able to rebuild and they didn't receive the funds. The funds that were distributed way later, the fact that uh, he didn't even respond to the hurricane until six weeks later or so, this is, and now they live in Pennsylvania. A lot of folks live in Pennsylvania. I mean, this is, I, I, I think it's just one of those, the, one, the confusing part about this is that you had a guy give a speech who knew that everything was going to be looked at through the lens of politics. It wasn't just doing a roast. This is a guy who was insulting a group of voters that Donald Trump needed. And, and doesn't that, don't you think that hurts him at the end of the day? I don't think it was helpful. But again, I think you do have to consider the fact that he's not a political person. He is a comedian. He obviously did not understand that this is a different crowd than the one he's used to appealing to. And in fact, he was kind of bombing during the set. So I think it actually should tell you a lot that the people in that arena didn't laugh at the joke yeah, and right. actually groaned at it. So I don't know why we're acting like this is representative of the MAGA movement when, again, it's a comedian being edgy. He went a little bit too far over the line. That's what happens when you're trying to be funny. And I think, again, I give comedians a lot more leeway. I also think, you know, on the point about the hurricane, we also know that the Puerto Rican government had a notorious corruption problem. And the reason why those funds were delayed is because they put on these, they attached strings to them to prevent the government from taking the money for itself and making sure that it was actually distributed to the Puerto Rican people. And then on this joke as well. by the way, the well, conservative party who did that. The statehood party is the conservative party. The person who's running for governor right now. Well, I don't care who did it. They were wrong. of Latinos for Trump. I don't, I don't care who, who's corrupt, uh, what party they're from. If they're corrupt, they're corrupt. That's bad, right? A, a, same thing with Donald Trump. I mean, he was, he, his response time was, was so slow when it comes to distributing those funds. And the funds, by the way, are still held up, as you said. Um, I, I just, real quick question as we wrap up. There was also these comments from Stephen uh, Miller afterwards, where he he leaned in and became very argumentative with a reporter from Chile um, when being asked about uh, whether or not you know they were talking about Venezuelan gangs, and a reporter asked him, you know, you say that Venezuela is safer now because all the gangs are in the United States, but can you give me the stats? And he wouldn't answer, and they got very angry. So there were a lot of moments from this rally that ended up going viral, where it didn't show the best of. The Trump campaign. Um, I just, I'm just curious, where does he go from here, and how does he flip the script? I just think that it's not as bad as people are saying, and I don't, I don't, I just reject the premise that this was like some huge disaster for Trump. He had 
all of Madison Square Garden filled to the brim with an additional 70 to 100,000 people outside wanting to be able to get in and see what was happening. It was a, a huge, massive rally. The really great moments outshined the ones that were maybe a little cringy or the comedian kind of falling flat with his jokes that a lot of people didn't find funny and that the campaign distanced themselves from. But I mean, if you look at this in, at the succession of Trump getting 30 million views on Joe Rogan, he's been doing tons of other huge podcasts. J.D. Vance was on uh, Tim Dillon and Theo Vaughn recently. They are clearly not running a traditional campaign in terms of their media strategy. And I think that's a good thing because media trust is at an all time low in this country. A lot of people are not watching CNN, MSNBC, or even the broadcast networks anymore. They're consuming their news from social media and from podcast hosts. And I think that it's smart for them to use those sort of unconventional channels to reach people who might be low to mid prop voters, which is a way of expanding a coalition. Well, we'll have to see. Lots of coalition building to come. Uh, <laughs> we have a lot more topics to talk about on Rising right after this. Donald Trump joined one of the world's most popular podcasters, Joe Rogan, for a three-hour conversation over the weekend. Trump's campaign was hoping to court the show's large young male audience. The two talked about everything from life on Mars to Trump's false claims on election fraud, where Joe Rogan seemed to push back. Let's watch. Because you said over and over again that you were robbed in 2020. Yeah, totally. What, how do you think you were robbed? Everybody always cuts you off. I'm going to allow... Do. Well, they not only cut you off. Well, what I'd rather do is we'll do it another time. And I would bring in papers that you would not believe. So many different papers. That election was so crooked. It was the most crooked election. Okay, but give me some examples of how. Well, let's start. Let's start okay. on the top and the easy ones. Okay. They were supposed to get legislative approval to do the things they did, and they didn't get it. In many cases, they didn't get it. What things? Anything. Legislative they made, approval like of like for extensions of the voting, for 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 voting earlier, for this, right. all different things. By law, they had to get legislative approvals. You don't have to go any further than that. If you take a look at Wisconsin, uh, they virtually admitted that the election was rigged, robbed, and stolen. They wouldn't give access in certain areas to the ballots because the ballots weren't signed. They weren't originals. They were... We could go into this stuff. We could go into the ballots or we could go into the overall. I'll give you another one. Are you going to present well, well, this let me, ever? Uh, like, what, do, you, do you think like Let me a, just give you one okay, more go ahead. before. The two also talked about how bad the mainstream media has treated him. Let's watch. You just assume because people loved you on The Apprentice, they were going to love you as a well, president? I think it would be so easy. You know, it's <laughs> well, very Well, it probably would have been if the media didn't attack you the way they did. If they didn't conflate you with Hitler... I mean, even today, like Kamala was talking about you and Hitler. You're, they're going to take what you said about Robert E. Lee. Oh, Donald Trump oh, wishes the South Robert won. E. That's yeah. right. He loves Robert they, E. Lee. They love to take things out of context and yeah. distort things. But well, they, they don't even have to take them out. They make them up entirely. Okay, They, they do make that them. too. But, you know, it's interesting when you mentioned the uh, – the, I was very popular. And uh, and all those people loved me. I mean, this uh, some of these, these women, they're so – they're so stupid. And uh, Joy, she would, every time she'd see me, I, like I'd be in the theater or something, and she'd, you have to be on the show again. Come on, come on, let's go. We have she to loved you. Trump also asked Rogan about his thoughts on J.D. Vance, while Rogan shared some insight as to why he had Trump on the podcast. And I appreciate J.D. Vance saying that. And by the way, I think he was a great pick. Do you like J.D. as a I pick? like him a lot. Yeah, You're allowed to say that. As no, I do. I like him <laughs> no, a lot. I think, he's good. I, I think he's a brilliant guy. And I think his ability to talk like a normal human being. He did. You did my friend Theo Vaughn's podcast. Right. And he just did it. How did he do he with it? He did great. And it, it, he just talks like a normal human being. Is that why you called me to do this? No, no. <laughs> we were gonna, I was, uh, he, was, I, he was a nice once guy. Once they shot you, I was like, he's got to come in here. It's all about timing. It's all about the timing. Uh, timing's I think good. our timing's perfect. Do you even yeah. have a scar in your ear? You got anything on there? I do. What do we say? What do we say? What do you got so, there? right over here. Oh, it's I, a tiny little they, mark. Like, it. Well, there you have it. Uh, 33 million views on this podcast, which I think is the most viewed Joe Rogan podcast ever, which says a lot because he does have a lot of subscribers. Um, look, I listened to the whole thing over the weekend. And Last weekend, your whole weekend. 1.5 times speed, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, look, I thought it was enjoyable. There were a lot of very personal moments, a lot of human moments. Uh, one of my favorites was 
when Trump was talking about this, uh, this trip he did to Afghanistan on Air Force One in the dead of the night and how they had all the lights off on the plane, all the lights off on the runway, and how he decided to go up in the cockpit and stand next to the pilot because of how really harrowing and kind of bizarre it is to do a blind landing of, of this nature. And it was nice to hear him talk about things that weren't explicitly political and just sort of his experiences being in the White House, going into the Lincoln bedroom for the first time and kind of being in awe of all of the history that was in that building. I thought it was really smart for him to do this and kind of show this human side of him. I think it's something similar to what he did during this McDonald's appearance where he was serving up the fries, just to kind of show the other side of him of just interacting with people and kind of just being a normal person. I mean, it was three hours, so I hope there was some normalcy that came out of him. Uh, my favorite part was actually this little clip where Joe Rogan was making fun of the weave and saying, this is this is one big weave now. You're really going off on tangents. <laughs> um, but, I mean, the reality, it was just like fact checkers were in full force on this one. I mean, I'm he, sure they were. He was uh, there. I mean, CNN has a running fact check, and it's like dozens and dozens at this point. Everything from California electricity to China and Taiwan to that he eliminated ISIS when you know the ISIS caliphate was liberated two years prior to his presidency. Of course, election denial, and that's actually, I think, what was the most fascinating was to see how Joe Rogan did push back for quite a long time. It was a long part of the interview where he pushed back asking for evidence, asking for more information. I mean, I wish Joe Rogan would have been a little bit more clear. Joe Rogan also said on his, his later podcast with his uh, co-host that he regrets not asking Donald Trump as to why he uh, was so resistant when it came to accepting COVID um, and the vaccine. And I that would have been nice for him to say to his large platform is to challenge him on on his vaccine response, especially given how Donald Trump was handing out the vaccine to Vladimir Putin. Um, at the same time, he was trying to, was resisting handing it out to Americans and challenging, you know, COVID at first. Uh, so, you know, the, the polling, he was all over the place with his polling estimates, saying he was down by astronomical numbers uh, in Wisconsin, and turns out he wasn't as, as low as he said. Of course, there's the outcome of the election. I think that's the biggest, the big lie that went on forever. And, um, and it wasn't really... I mean, you'd think that after making these claims over and over again uh, for years, that he would have a more solid response to a pretty, you know, light interview. And the same with the enemy with, from within. You know, J.D. Vance, which we'll talk about, was out the same day saying that Donald Trump didn't say that, but there was Donald Trump in this interview with Joe Rogan uh, talking about the enemy of within being Adam Schiff and Nancy Pelosi on the other side and that he would go after them with the military. I mean, it's just... It must get old being a surrogate for Donald Trump in trying to rewrite the words that he continues to say, even after <laughs> they rewrite it again. Well, he did not say to send the military on Pelosi and Schiff and uh, et cetera. That was a different set of comments that he made. But um, I, I, I'm a little confused by your characterization of what Joe Rogan might have asked jo uh, Donald Trump about COVID, because it would actually be from the opposite perspective. Said this. That... If you could find the quote, that would be great, because Joe Rogan was notoriously a lot softer on COVID than Trump was, especially in the first six months to uh, of the pandemic response, and was very skeptical about the vaccines and the emergency use authorization. Um, Rogan revealed, okay, so he was asked by another guest, uh, Brendan Schaub, mm -hmm. um, a USC fighter, did you ask him why he was against vaccines? And then Rogan revealed, no, I didn't, but I also wanted to stay composed because the moment there was a moment when he brought up the polio vaccine, and I was like, oh, my God. I didn't want to corrupt, correct him or pull up a chart showing when polio actually dropped off after the vaccine was introduced. Despite the variants, that's a rough one. When you look at the data, there's a lot to unpack, like measles and other cases, with what actually happened. I think that Rogan has pulled back, probably from some pressure. Yeah, well, I would also say that those are, that's not COVID vaccines. That's a different, obviously. They were talking about COVID, and then it shifted to polio, is what he's saying. Yeah, so, because Trump obviously was very pro-COVID vaccine. He granted the emergency use authorization and Eventually. created Operation Warp Speed, right, that would have... Uh, allow those to be developed in the way that they were. He was actually very proud of that. Eventually, once it became popular and there was enough pushback, but it took him long enough. I mean, he didn't even want to shut down the economony. He didn't understand the severity of He shouldn't have shut down the economy. It was a disaster. Well, that was actually, I would say, one of the biggest mistakes of his presidency was listening to people like Anthony Fauci and Deborah Birx who wanted to shut down the economy when they should have focused on protecting the most vulnerable groups as opposed to doing this blanket lockdown. And Trump absolutely was pro-vaccine from the very beginning. Again, he he authorized Operation Warp Speed to pursue the development of them. Uh, per Congress's push. 
But listen, the economy, if we didn't shut it down, it wasn't just about vulnerable members of our community in the beginning. Everybody who could get COVID had could potentially end up in the hospital and potentially die. But the it's risk was a, we probably the know risk it. was was incredibly low, and they're not. That's we didn't know that. And then later we, when we got a vaccine, did, the problem vaccine is the it lowered. But listen, if we hadn't shut it down, think of how many millions more people would have died. They wouldn't have. Would have sa- that's, just, that's just not true. Johns Hopkins University did a study on this where they found that the lockdowns actually didn't save any lives. But going back to Rogan, um, I mean, I, let's talk about the fact as well that Kamala Harris has refused, or not refused, they're in conversations to do it, but it doesn't seem like she's going to do it. And my guess is it's because Joe Rogan does not agree to any terms. You go on, you do the podcast, it's three hours long. Yep. He asks whatever he wants to ask about. There's no filtering of questions, et cetera. And we have seen reporting that apparently they couldn't agree on terms. Maybe. Because, again, Joe Rogan doesn't do terms. I mean, do you think I mean, it's a mistake be, for her not to do the podcast? Terms could be days of the week. Terms could be times. I mean, there's a lot of things. If you're in the final week of an election, there's a lot of things that come with terms. Um, do I think it's a mistake? No. I mean, I think she should do all media, but I think that that's not her base. Just like Call Her Daddy is not Donald Trump's base, and Donald Trump should go on Call Her Daddy. I'd love to see that one. Donald Trump should go on CBS News. Donald Trump should show up at a you know a town hall. Donald Trump should talk to. He has done a lot of town halls. Well, he was he didn't he was supposed to do one, and then he he canceled. I mean, he's been canceling interviews with anybody who could issue question, you know, questions that are a little bit more challenging. Who is he canceled with? CBS News. Uh, he, he did he cancel three, with or did they not agree to three, the interview? It was last week. He canceled three interviews the morning of and cited being exhausted. And then his campaign That's said not being true. exhausted. And then nobody he said, said he wasn't. Nobody his campaign said, issued a statement. It was his press. Saying that he was exhausted. He was exhausted. Was exhaustion. If you could find that, I'd love, to, I'd love to see it. We covered it last week. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. We have a lot more topics to talk about on Rising right after this. Talk about a split screen. Donald Trump and Kamala Harris spent the second to last weekend before the election zeroing in on Latino voters, now the largest minority bloc in the country, voting bloc. On one side of the screen was Trump's sold-out rally Sunday at Madison Square Garden in New York City, the candidate's hometown. Social media erupted after comedian Tony Hinchcliffe delivered these remarks. Let's watch. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah. I think it's called Puerto Rico. Okay. All right. Okay. We're getting there. Again, normally I don't follow the national anthem, everybody. The comment drew backlash from high-profile Puerto Ricans, including Bad Bunny, who has 45 million followers. He responded by posting a video of Kamala Harris. Let's watch. I will never forget what Donald Trump did and what he did not do when Puerto Rico needed a caring and a competent leader. He abandoned the island, tried to block aid after back-to-back devastating hurricanes, and offered nothing more than paper towels and insults. Jennifer Lopez posted the same video, including her endorsement of the VP, as did Ricky Martin and Ariana Grande. Meanwhile, Harris's campaign in Pennsylvania uh, on Sunday targeted Latino voters. Let's watch. We will win because here's how I think about it. When you know what you stand for, you know what to fight for. And this election is about two extremely different visions for our nation. One, Donald Trump, who is focused on the past and himself. And we are not going back. Pennsylvania's Latino eligible voter population has more than doubled since 2000, from 206,000 people to 620,000 in 2023, according to U.S. Census Bureau figures. And Puerto Ricans representing a majority in critical cities like Allentown. Here to discuss further is Melissa Mark Viverito, the former Speaker of the New York City Council. Melissa, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Sure. So let's just start with this. What do you think the reaction has been to this joke from Tony Hinchcliffe? I saw some Puerto Ricans who attended the rally saying they weren't bothered by it. Obviously, others have found it to be incredibly offensive. What impact do you expect that this will have on the Puerto Rican voting population? Look, it's obviously viral, right? This is, ob- this is going 
uh, throughout Puerto Rican communities across the country in key battleground states in particular, right? We got to understand that, as mentioned, right, 400,000 Puerto Ricans live in Pennsylvania. You have over a million Puerto Ricans who live in Florida. You have 200,000 Puerto Ricans who are in Texas. And like that, there are communities of Puerto Ricans across this country that are in critical, in critical swing states and important uh, air communities, right? So it's, it's offensive. We have a, an understanding as Puerto Ricans historically that we have been uh, tested upon, we have been um, uh, dehumanized in many ways. This is a part and parcel of us being a colony of the United States. But you couldn't find a bigger contrast yesterday, right, where Puerto Rico was on the lips of both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And you have one party in terms of the MAGA Republicans that embrace a rhetoric that is dehumanizing. Uh, and then you have a uh, a presidential candidate on the Democratic side who, yes, no candidate is perfect, and many people may not agree 100 percent, but it is a candidate we know is being genuine and sincere in reaching out and wanting to develop a partnership and a collaboration with a community that she knows is critically important. So I think that that was an incredible stark contrast, and the level of offensiveness right, that happened as a result of this is galvanizing many of us and galvanizing the artis artistic community. Community. Uh, someone like a bad bunny who probably would not have weighed in otherwise. But when it comes to the dignity and respect of a people, um, he said enough is enough. And he stepped up and he posted the video on his Instagram account for 45 million. Um, I think that this is definitely something that for those folks who maybe were thinking twice about going out to vote, who maybe were not as enthusiastic, it would generate that level of engagement in terms of going out and actually voting. Um, but, you know, we don't know, and I have a hard time believing that those people who have committed to vote for Trump um, would would be dissuaded to vote for him. I think those are people that are very much stuck in. And this is fascism, this is authoritarianism, uh, and, and this is something that is, to me, very much a cult behavior. And people are, are very much, um, uh, uh, you know, digging in when it comes to, to voting. So we'll we'll see. And it's hard to gauge that behavior. But I think for people that were thinking maybe of just sitting it out and not as enthusiastic, this definitely has mobilized many of us uh, to engage more deeply. Melissa, it's interesting because it does seem like we've been waiting for this October surprise. And this is an incredibly large voting uh, block in, in a swing state like Pennsylvania. Um, some of this voting block is a product of a displacement that happened uh, because of Hurricane Maria, and, and they're the diaspora. But um, they're also not all Democrats. So I, I'm wondering if you could help us understand just how, because I think, you know, the media, frankly, sometimes generalizes that all Latino voters are the same and all Puerto Ricans are the same. Um, but, you know, there are conservative Puerto Ricans, and, and Donald Trump, uh, his campaign yes. had enlisted a, a reggaeton artist who's very conservative in Pennsylvania about a month ago. Uh, so is it going to be like a uniform reaction? And how much does Donald Trump's previous actions in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria uh, play into this? Well, look, I think you're, you're correct, right? No one community is monolithic. And I think that when you talk about the Puerto Rican community, you can't just talk about us in the diaspora. You have to also talk about the politics that are happening in the island and on the island right now, where we have a historic election happening also on November 5th. We have a very strong uh, uh, conservative movement in Puerto Rico. They've actually formed their own party and they have uh, been able to vote in one election cycle uh, quite, you know, maybe four uh, representatives into the Puerto Rican legislature. And their support is, is growing in this election cycle, not to the point where they're going to be able to assume the, the governorship, for instance, but the governor candidate, gubernatorial candidate in Puerto Rico that represents the conservative statehood party, because it is a conservative party, um, is a MAGA Republican who tried to distance herself from the comments yesterday by basically trying to say it's only the comedian's uh, point of view that's not the point of view of the uh, Trump administration or the Trump campaign, when we know for a fact that you have to go through several layers of vetting in order to even get up on that stage. So these are comments that are fully embraced uh, by the campaign of Donald Trump, but yet this governor's candidate in Puerto Rico 
uh, is still holding strong with her support for Donald Trump. So speaking of the Puerto Rican community, there is gonna, there are going to be those elements, but still the overwhelming support is for Democratic candidate Kamala Harris, right? And so that is true. And there's issues that move the community um, as a recent poll that was done by Hispanic Federation and Latino Victory demonstrated that was just came out a couple of weeks ago or last week that people care about obviously economic issues, uh, but that within that uh, the, the, the Latinos, there is 70 to 72 percent overwhelming support, right, for Kamala Harris. So that's there. But we obviously want to continue to strengthen that engagement and participation. So, yes, we're not monolithic. Yes, there is a, um, you know, a strong fundamentalist uh, conservative element within the Latino community and in the Puerto Rican community as well. And there are those who are, unfortunately, um, and embarrassingly supporting Donald Trump, despite all the harm he has done to Puerto Rico, not only in his words, but in his, in his actions in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. I wanted to ask you a question about the joke itself, because I think there is a misinterpretation going on where people was assuming he was referring to the people of Puerto Rico or Puerto Rico itself as trash. But we do know that for a long time, Puerto Rico has had an actual trash problem, right? I mean, in 2017, NPR ran the headline, Puerto Rico struggles under the weight of its own garbage. Global Press Journal, Trash Crisis, leaves Puerto Rico near, near the brink. And in 2016, before the hurricane, PBS wrote, Puerto Rico struggles as trash piles up. Doesn't it seem more likely that that was the intent of the joke? No, absolutely not. I think that, you know, when we talk about racism and when we talk about the dehumanization of a people, those are sometimes, you know, those are deep rooted sentiments that are, at the, at the, at are being manifested, right, and projected. And so there is always been this element as a colonized people that we are seen as the other, that we are seen as less than, and then become the, quote, butt of jokes, right? That's not acceptable. There is no way, no way that this can be justified. And there was a galvanizing moment years ago when I first moved to the United States and to, and to New York City, uh, when Seinfeld did a moment where they burned the Puerto Rican flag um, and that rallied people to such an extent, there is a basic dignity, right, that you just don't cross the line with. And there is no way of justifying what was said or trying to parse it or to say, oh, people can't take a joke. No, because there is that element of dehumanization that is at the root of it and that somehow we can justify and somehow we can find a way of laughing at it. And somehow we've been ta we're taking things too seriously and that the victimized uh, continue to be the ones that are oppressed. That's what's happening here. There's no way of accepting this. We won't accept it. And the fact that people are stepping up, even outside of our community to stand with us, is demonstrating that we are valued members. Humanity is a valued uh, sentiment and a, 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 a very important uh, value to hold. And we're not going to accept that from an administration, uh, from a campaign and a former administration that all it sought to do was to hurt Latinos, to hurt our immigrant brothers and sisters, to dehumanize us as Puerto Ricans. That's just no way of, of being able to find any, there's no room for me to find a way to justify what was said yesterday. That's just not acceptable. Real quick, Melissa, we're about to wrap, but I just, I just wanted to note um, and get your reaction. So this comedian was supposed to have uh, some some shows on the island of Puerto Rico uh, coming up that were canceled. But um, there's also some hypocrisy in that a lot of Trump's donors and biggest supporters, like John Paulson, who's being floated as the Treasury Secretary, and uh, Jake Paul and Logan Paul, who live on the island of Puerto Rico, are taking part in a trump back tax incentive uh, program called Act 22. It's a loophole. So they've been moving yes. to the island, the same island that they're calling an island of garbage. So just quick reaction. We got to wrap, but I uh, want to give you a chance to respond to that. No, I mean, I found it interesting, right, that on the eve when he's going to have these three or four shows in Puerto Rico, um, he decides to go on this bigoted tirade, right, against the Puerto Rican people. Um, I've never heard of this so-called comedian. I don't know who his audience is. Um, I don't know who his audience could potentially be in Puerto Rico, if not for maybe <laughs> those that are coming and, and, and displacing local Puerto Ricans through this tax incentive. Um, but yes, it is a big problem 
And um, unfortunately, in the rollout that was done yesterday by the campaign of, of candidate Kamala Harris, uh, there was no discussion of the fiscal control board, for instance, that has caused a lot of economic harm to Puerto Rico. Um, and that, again, the issue of colonization is at the root of a lot of the challenges that we have as an island. And that has to be addressed and that is not seriously being addressed. So we're hoping with the change in administration in Puerto Rico and the change um, in administration here that we can make some further progress. All right, thank you, Melissa. We appreciate you joining us today on Rising. Thank you. What's in a picture? Well, it depends on what's in it, especially when it involves the election. A video surfaced la late last week that showed someone destroying ballots marked for former President Donald Trump in Pennsylvania. Here's the video in question. Donald Trump. Again. Donald Trump. Motherfucker. CBS News reported it on the video, Rising could not identify the original source, but it turns out the video was fake. And it was not only manufactured, but spread by Russia, U.S. officials say. Though quickly debunked by election officials in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, the damage had already been done as it circulated on social media, including Elon Musk's ex. As of Thursday afternoon, it had racked up over 342,000 shares. Russian propagandists have also targeted Vice President Harris and her run running mate, Governor Tim Walz, per USA Today. This was the third incident this month in which agencies found a fake video going after Harris. Joining us now to talk about how fake videos and wrong information are playing a role in our elections is Joseph Sandler, partner at Sandler Reef, the law firm. Thank you so much, for Joseph, for joining us. Thank you for having me. So you deal with, uh, you're an elections attorney, and I think typically we are, we have these conversations about election night, what to prepare for, if we don't have a vote count, how long is it going to last, but now we got to throw in all this disinformation um, and also the reaction just to, to 2020's events um, on the ground in several swing states. So, you know, from your perspective, uh, as someone who's worked in this space for a long time with parties, how do they prepare for what happens in the lead up to this election uh, on Tuesday? So the misinformation and the dissemination of misinformation in elections is really uh, nothing new. Um, the, there was a lawsuit involving the Republican National uh, Committee, you know, going back to the 80s uh, in which they disseminated, you know, misinformation about uh, what when election day was about where to cast your vote and so forth, that was a subject of a consent decree that remained in effect for many years. Um, it's reached a new level, obviously, in the age of Trump, and particularly uh, with uh, malign foreign actors uh, getting into the act in a big and very sophisticated way. But you know, the way to deal with it, essentially, and the effective ways to deal with it. Um, haven't changed that much. Uh, I mean, there are new technologies to counter, you know, bots and basically send a message back to the people that got it uh, online. Um, but when you talk about election day, the main thing is that both the campaign and the parties uh, and election officials have to be prepared very quickly to correct misinformation um, by being set up to you know, send robocalls, which of course election officials uh, can do, um, to registered voters, putting people out uh, on radio shows that, that are widely listened to, um, getting you know getting the word out right away to voters uh, to to correct misinformation in real time. So so far, you've mentioned some examples of what you say is misinformation coming from the right or being done to benefit Donald Trump, for example, from the Russians. 
We also know that Iran has been trying to sow discord against Donald Trump and has even been found to have been plotting an assassination attempt of the former president. So could you just talk a little bit about the actual goal of these foreign influence campaigns, which typically is more aimed at spreading general divisiveness and discord than it is in favor of any one candidate? Uh, I think that in the case of Russia, um, the the effort is definitely to favor you know one candidate. <laughs> uh, in the case of Iran, it's also to favor you know to, to basically try to disfavor Donald Trump. Although I'm not aware of any systematic effort by Iran to spread disinformation about the election uh, in the U.S. Although of course you know that's not that's not out of the question. There, um, you know, that they've been identified as. as you know, actually trying to commit violence against Trump, which is a horrible thing, uh, and but a, a completely you know different kind of problem. Um, yeah, I think most of the foreign malign actors, as well as the U.S. actors that spread this information, are definitely trying to to hurt one party and benefit the other party. Joseph, um, going back to 2020, we saw uh, quite outrageous events occurring at polling stations. Uh, in swing states, I'll recall in Arizona, and uh, I believe it was Glendale or in Maricopa County, uh, there was an event where Alex Jones showed up at a polling site. There was there were reports of intimidation of voters to the point where now uh, folks have had to find money in the budget to prepare for election day. And I heard in a report, uh, I believe it was with NPR, that in, in that same polling uh, location in Arizona, and I think uh, several others, they even have snipers that are going to be on the roof, uh, roofs of, around the facility just in preparation. Obviously, authorities, not random snipers. Um, I mean, there's a lot of organizing happening, whether it's just typical organizing like the RNC, CNN reported the RNC is uh, trying to get poll workers to show up um, on their behalf. Uh, but I, I assume Democrats do the same thing. But, but what are you seeing? Like, what are the unusual events that, you're, that parties are preparing for for actual election day that could potentially be interference? Well, I think that the, the Republicans, uh, there's concern that uh, Republican poll observers um, will, uh, you know, attempt to intimidate or interfere with voters. But the basic training that we've seen for Republican uh, poll watchers, to the extent that they're just doing what they're allowed to do in terms of observing, it's perfectly uh, appropriate. Likewise, the Democratic Party, certainly in all the battleground states and many others, will have virtually every polling place covered with an observer who can uh, report any problems or issues with people voting and try to get those problems resolved in real time. That's what the voter protection programs of the Democratic uh, Party organized at the national level and through the state parties, you know, attempt to do. Um, I think that with respect to the, the threat of, in, of intimidation and even uh, violence, you know, harassment at the polls, we are going to see that again, and we may see more of it. And election officials are absolutely uh, prepared for that. Uh, and I think law enforcement is prepared for that, uh, although there is a perennial problem uh, of election officials in these county election boards not having, you know, all the resources they need to do it. But there, there's no, this is not going to be a surprise. They are prepared. I just want to push back a little bit because you said earlier that the domestic misinformation, as you refer to it, refer to it from people within the U.S., is all aimed at helping one candidate as well. But we've also seen plenty of viral misinformation coming from the left, whether it's people speculating that Trump staged the assassination attempt in Butler, Pennsylvania. That even came from Reid Hoffman, a Democratic mega donor. We saw Kamala's wins, the viral Twitter account, uh, falsely claiming that Joe Burrow had endorsed Kamala Harris. So I just, I find it a little bit troubling that throughout the interview, you've basically tried to pin this on one side of the aisle. Well, I think you have to just, you know, obviously I'm a Democratic uh, side <laughs> uh, election attorney and election attorneys tend to be on, on one side or the other. Uh, I think that the kind of misinformation you're talking about is uh, obviously to be condemned when it comes from our side as well. But what you cited is not specifically about the election. It's not information people are destroying ballots. This, you know, in misinformation about whether people can register to the same day, where they vote, how they can vote. Uh, that that's a different kind of thing. But to the extent that we're talking about information about the candidates, 
uh, or about their positions on the issues or about their characters or actions that are just completely false. Obviously, that's to be condemned uh, from both sides. Um, although, you know, I, I think you can make a pretty strong case that there's a, there's a lot more of it that it has come from the right. But the real, I think the, the focus as we approach election day is on disinformation about the election itself. And if, and I, election. And if I may ask you about another incident that we're, we're still learning some about, but we did hear that in Pennsylvania, there's been a massive uh, voter fraud bust, 2,500 or so ballots that were turned in after the date required to register as a voter, are you following that case at all? And is there anything that you can tell us about um, anything we've learned about this attempt to fraudulently register voters? Well, first of all, it was not, um, th th these were not forms that were turned in after the deadline. They were turned in before the deadline and the Lancaster County authorities uh, evidently suspected that some of them were fraudulent. Uh, information, I, I don't think there's any indication that it's anything like 2,500 uh, forms and uh, as of this point, we don't know, you know, how many applications are involved and what the specific uh, issues are. But clearly, uh, to the you know, county boards are supposed to be checking these um, and and identifying instances where of invalid registrations, and those people won't get on the rolls. Joseph, just to just to wrap, um, if we don't know the results on Tuesday, uh, the fifth. Where do you see this going? Is this something that's going to play out um, at the Capitol uh, again, or potentially at uh, local, you know, offices where they're counting ballots? I mean, how? What are we anticipating um, for post-election night? Since it is, I mean, people anticipate that we won't have the results uh, the night of the election. Exactly. If it's as close as it seems, the main reason we won't have results uh, that night or for a couple of days is, is because of the need to count in a mail-in ballots uh, and the volume of those that, you know, are going to be received by these states and particularly in a state like Pennsylvania, where the election uh, officials, the county election boards are not permitted to start opening the ballots and determining which are valid uh, until election day. So that takes, you know, that takes time. I think the, the message is, uh, and this has come from election experts and on both sides, people have to be patient. Uh, I think any effort to, by one camp or another to prematurely claim that the election's over when the, when the numbers indicate that it can't be called um, is something that, the, that, you know, the media needs to educate, to continue to educate the public about. And people we need to be patient until enough votes are counted so you really know who won each state. Well, uh, we're going to be learning as we go, as we often do in these tight elections. I'm old enough to remember 2000 uh, and 2020. Thank you so much for joining us, Joseph. <laughs> Australia has just denied far-right-wing influencer Candace Owens from coming to the country as part of her planned speaking tour. Australia's Immigration Minister Tony Burke said, quote, Australia's national interest is best served when Candace Owens is somewhere else, from downplaying the impact of the Holocaust with comments about Nazi physician Joseph Mengele through, the claims, through to claims that Muslims started slavery, Candace Owens has the capacity to incite discord in almost every direction. For context, Owens has long been a controversial figure because of claims she's made about the Jewish, Muslim, and transgender communities. The Anti-Defamation Commission, who pushed for Owens to be barred in Australia, said the decision was, quote, a victory for truth, for decency, and for the millions of Jewish souls and millions of others whose memory she so shamelessly desecrated. Owens had scheduled a five-date speaking tour in Australia in November, where she planned to hit five different cities. Burke's office has confirmed that her visa was denied. I guess you can uh, deny a visa in Australia for... Plenty of reasons. I mean, we, we, we have different free speech laws in our country. We have the strongest pretty much in the world in, in uh, modern democracy. Uh, I, I was actually really surprised by this. You yeah. Know. I mean, she's also not an Australian citizen, so obviously the rules would be able to be applied more broadly, same as we have more latitude in rejecting visas from people that we don't want to come here, although we don't exercise that authority very much. I actually wish we would enforce our borders as strictly as Australia is, but um, I guess that seems to be a pipe dream as of late. So they have a thing where the visa rejection can be not just a uh, failure to meet health requirements, but also character. And it's not just about criminal history. It's 
potentially in this situation of inciting violence. I mean, Australia does have a pretty large conservative population. This isn't, uh, for folks who aren't familiar, you know, Australia isn't some sort of progressive uh, stronghold in, in the West. While they do have a progressive side, just like our country, they're, they've had conservative leadership leaders in the past. And uh, I'm, I'm actually quite surprised that they would be so bold about this refusal. Um, but, you know, yeah, I wonder if it might have the effect of backfiring and potentially exposing more Australians to Candace Owens than the people who would have just showed up to some of these events that she uh, plans on having. That's always the danger with shutting down people you disagree with, is that you end up giving them plenty of free earned media. More people want to see what they're saying so that they understand why they're so controversial. Um, and you end up having uh, the opposite effect of what you intended. So I guess from a wisdom standpoint, is this the best idea if you actually are trying to get people to avoid seeing or hearing anything from Candace Owens? So turns out they have a list of the five reasons why uh, visa applications are review, uh, refused, the five most common reasons. Uh, number one, that you don't have a genuine intention to stay temporarily in Australia, that makes sense. Uh, two, overclaimed points in the points test. I don't know what that is, but I guess they have a points test. Uh, three, don't meet health requirements. And then, bing, ding, 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 ding. Number four, have provided false or misleading information. And number five, do not meet the character requirements. So misinformation, disinformation, I mean, she's still out there on the internet. I wonder how they're going to combat that. But uh, it does alternatively show that they're concerned about how extremism is spreading. Of course, you know, it's happening everywhere. It's not just something that happens in the United States in the face of elections. Uh, I think that there is a universal understanding that the power of disinformation um, and extremism, as, as she said, against hateful, you know, hateful extremism against specific groups to gin up, you know, views on the internet, I guess, uh, are, it's a major concern from the government there. Yeah, and they, this is not the first time that they've taken a move akin to this. Um, Lauren Southern, who was a commentator for Rebel Media and went on to become an independent, independent documentarian, um, talked about how she had a hard time traveling back and forth between Australia and Canada to see her family because her husband's family is from Australia. And there were multiple times where she was either followed around the airport by security prevented from boarding her flight, told that she wasn't allowed to fly, all kinds of craziness. And so my concern is if, if the United States were to have a similar kind of policy, it obviously is very subjective, right? What, what is misinformation? What is considered um, to be a defect of character? I mean, I followed Lauren Southern's work for a long time. It is, I don't think, hateful. Uh, um, the Australian government has claimed that it was. I don't think it's hateful to raise questions about immigration policy. And so this, to me, is a, a worrying precedent about who gets to decide who is, uh, who is actually not meeting this character standard. And it might be easy to say, well, sure, Candace doesn't, but who else might be caught in this grab bag of crackdowns? I mean, she's, she's definitely said some pretty crazy stuff in terms of... of you know, punching Nazis and supporting the Proud Boys, and, and the Proud Boys are a hate group. Um, I, I mean, I think it's up to the government to decide. I mean, and, and what's interesting about when that happened to her was it was under conservative government. So clearly this is not something that's partisan uh, in Australia and that they are looking at things very carefully. I, I, again, like, I don't know if it's not taking like precedent because we have different free speech laws in this country. Pretty much everything is protected, uh, whether we, it's really safe or not, and I think it's affecting our democracy. But... Um, I do find these stories really interesting in that, like, we do start to learn a little bit more about uh, how other democracies and republics, you know, discuss speech in their countries, whether it's the UK or France or, uh, or Australia or Germany right now, which is dealing with a far right rising up again. I mean, Germany has probably some of the strongest laws in terms of, of reactionary, rightfully so, to World War II. And you're seeing an emerging right uh, in Germany as well, that they can't control the internet. I mean, it's still going to happen. People are still going to find extremism in different places. Maybe it's not in real life. Maybe it's not at, at events where people can speak anymore. Um, in, but they can find it, whether the dark web or just right there in the front of the web. Well, and again, going back to the point I was making earlier, some of the danger in trying to arbitrarily suppress what people are saying is that you drive it underground and it ends up growing stronger and usually more hateful. People, uh, we've seen 
historically, according to speech experts, that speech that does get censored in some way um, is driven underground, it's on the dark web, et cetera, and the people who access it are more likely to become radicalized because they aren't hearing the other side, they aren't getting the normal pushback that they might because it's all very hidden out of plain view. I think we have a much healthier society, a much healthier dialogue when we are all able to speak openly, even if that means sometimes we get pushback, sometimes people say things that might offend you. The beauty of having a system and a culture that values free speech is that you're able to argue against them and make your point more effectively and show why they're wrong. If we were living in a place where our tech platforms were truly democratized, I would say, for the most part, I'm in favor of that. I'm not a free speech absolutist, but I do think that there is, you know, it's very easy to add uh, gas to the fire and really give a boost to extremist uh, language, whether it's from a foreign actor who's trying to cause division on either side, by the way, it's happening on the left as well. Uh, or, you know, blatantly just the algorithms being skewed in one, one direction or another. They're very anti-women, uh, they're very anti, um, they're very racist at this point, and they've been investigated. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's, that's the problem with this free speech absolutism. I'm not saying that you're, you're that, but free speech absolutism that exists out there right now is that it's completely denying the fact that tech companies have a hand in what kind of conversations um, and where they're being steered online right now. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's fair to say. I mean, I obviously had issues, major issues, with some of the big tech companies prior to Elon Musk's ownership of X in particular because we saw over, uh, over censorship of right-wing voices. And now you see... And left-wing um, voices, by the way. Right, I mean, sir, he, Bernie, Bernie Sanders supporters, yeah. et cetera, and I found that very problematic. And I obviously the platform is not perfect now, but I would say that Elon Musk has at least expressed a desire for it to be a more open platform. He doesn't want to be in the business of picking winners and losers of speech. And I see your face. You look <laughs> you look like you don't believe that. Um, I mean, do you not agree that Twitter has allowed more content as opposed to less when it was under Jack Dorsey? It has 80% fewer users right now, and it's been devalued. And there have been a lot of accounts that have But that's down. a question about users, not well, content, right? Well, I mean, that's probably a reflection of what kind of content's being driven, and obviously straight from the source, he's pushing it. But you know what's great about this show? We can have a debate. It is, you and I can go back and forth, no one's censoring us, but we do have time limits on our segments, so. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> um, all right, more to come. Uh, we have a lot more topics to discuss after this. Uh, more rising. Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner is suing Elon Musk and America PAC for their million dollar giveaway to registered voters who sign a petition in favor of First Amendment rights like freedom of speech, as well as the Second Amendment right to bear arms. Musk has been doing the $1 million giveaway as a means of boosting support for Donald Trump and associated causes to the campaign. And we are going to break all of this right now, Nomiki. So they are accusing Elon Musk of campaign finance violations by doing this million dollar giveaway. Um, my understanding is that Elon Musk did some pretty creative maneuvering to avoid actually giving money for the act of registering to vote, which is the way that this was sort of interpreted as when he first announced this plan. But what he's doing instead is he's actually giving it to people who sign the petition so that it's not directly tied to the act of registering to vote. And then he's also, instead of giving these people just a $1 million check, he's also making them independent contractors with America PAC. So they're basically getting paid as employees of the company. I mean, it's definitely creative. I just don't think it's going to hold up in a court of law. The DOJ has already issued a warning. And and Krasner, the Philadelphia uh, district attorney, has what, what they... Uh, announced today was that they're actually running an illegal, unregulated lottery. And I'm going to give you the quote so you so we understand. America PAC and Musk are lulling Philadelphia uh, citizens and others in the Commonwealth and other swing states in the upcoming election to have uh, to give up their personal identifying information and make a political pledge in exchange for the chance to win one million dollars. That's a lottery, the suit alleges, and it is indisputable and unlawful. It is indisputably an unlawful lottery under an unambiguous Pennsylvania law. All lotteries in Pennsylvania must be regulated by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So, I mean, as much as he is trying to maneuver these loopholes, and I think what's interesting about it is that if the DOJ does uh, take this further, which is separate from this uh, this case here, the penalties are tens of thousands of dollars for the first 
for the first uh, round, the first fines, but also jail time. I mean, this is also extremely serious. And I think, you know, we saw this with the SEC when uh, Elon Musk was tweeting out <laughs> information that he shouldn't have been sharing and he received a major fine. But if he gets several fines in that situation, he could also lead to jail time. It seems like Elon Musk doesn't really believe that the law applies to him. Uh, I, I would guess that he probably had a lot of lawyers look at this before he decided to implement it. That's why he decided to do this independent contractor situation to avoid it being a straight giveaway, which would give him this, um, per perhaps shielding him from this law that you're talking about in relation to lotteries and not being approved by the state. Um, in this situation, uh, you know, that I think the law that they're citing, that they were defending themselves on with the uh, DOJ, you know, they might have some some room to maneuver. But the other side of this, and this is just Elon Musk being Elon Musk, I mean, you can have good lawyers, but then Elon Musk decides, even though he's the founder of this PAC, and PACs are supposed to have super PACs, there's a firewall. You are not supposed to interact with the campaign directly or indirectly through another person, although that's always hard to prove. But he appears on stage with Donald Trump. He campaigns for Donald Trump on social media. These are major violations where, yeah, he can afford $10,000, but it can go up to five years in prison or both. And I, if I were his lawyer, I'd be saying, stand down, just like his lawyers told him to do so with the SEC, and he did not listen. His board members told them to, to stand down, and he did not listen. And as a result, he's still in deep trouble with the SEC regarding his purchase of X. I mean, these are critical issues, but if you, just like Donald Trump, if you don't follow your lawyer's Guide, guidelines, I mean, that's a big problem. Yeah, I guess the question would be whether or not appearing on stage counts as illegal coordination. I mean, It does, it does. You can't appear, you can't speak to the campaign, you can't speak to the candidate. That is very clear law. Anybody, I've worked with super PACs before. Well, you can speak to the candidate. I mean, the just, well, just recently we learned that there was a change in the law that allows them to actually coordinate on door knocking efforts and voter outreach and some it's for C4s, 51C4s. So Super PAC is different. 51C4 has a political loophole in which you can do education and there's a, a little bit of an opening, but Super PACs are Super PACs. And that's the difficult part of the situation is I think he just plays it a little loose. I guess I, I'm a little curious about that because if that's the case, then why have they not gone after him for appearing on stage at multiple rallies yet? I think they have. I think a lot of people have, that's part of the allegations, is that you know this is a man who he's actively engaging in this issue. I mean, part of it is also like the coordination, as much as it's something that's taken very seriously by political action committees and people in politics, the coordination is like you're going to get what? you know, you're going to have a penalty after the election. I mean, it usually is just a penalty. He doesn't seem to care. So what was put forward before the, the DOJ was very much about uh, violating campaign finance laws. So, I mean, if, if I were him, I would just, I would have stayed out of the super PAC. I would have given the money to the super PAC and not gotten involved any other way and then continue to go campaign for Donald Trump. But, you know, I guess we'll see. Yeah, so here's here's where the FEC determines coordination. FEC regulations provide for a three-pronged test to determine whether communication is coordinated. A communication must satisfy all three prongs of the test to be considered a coordinated communication, and as a result, count against contribution limits. The three prongs consider the source of payment, subject the subject matter of the communication, and the interaction between the person paying for the communication and the candidate or political party committee. So I wouldn't think that appearing on stage at a rally would hit all three of these prongs, considering there's no payment rendered. Well, this is a C4, and the PAC also, by the way, is is a source of payment, subject matter of communication, and the interaction uh, between the person paying. Yes, that's that actually does violate it. The fact that he gives money to the political action committee, the political action committee gives money to the campaign, although there's limits. Um, political action committee puts out ads about uh, the the candidate, although the candidate is supposedly not supposed to be aware or the campaign is not supposed to be aware of those, of what the political action committee's ads are saying or their actions on the ground, like the, the lottery. Um, and then, you know, this person, the founder of the political action committee who gave, at this point, I mean, almost $100 million to it. But the test here is, is the payment has to be in relation to this action that you're talking about, not just that the PAC gets money from the candidate and vice versa. That doesn't cover everything related to communication between the two, the communication that is a violation has to have a payment attached to it, right? No, so, no, 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 no. That, I mean, that's what it says here. First off, it's the C, you're, you're looking at C4 laws, so that's that's the first part here. Um, the second part is, you. if I am a... This is for committees. If I am on, I'm looking at the FCC. <clears throat> so if I am a, a, 
an officer of a super PAC, right? And you're running for office. And I am a super PAC supporting you. I cannot have communication with you. If I am caught having coffee with you, dinner with you, and talking about the campaign, I am violating the law. And he was on stage. That He was on stage with Donald Trump and has given money personally to Donald Trump. So yeah, it is actually. And that's why they issued this lawsuit. The DOJ said that they're investigating, uh, warning him, I should say. And, uh, and, and Krasner, now Krasner did not decide to go forward with that argument. He decided to focus on this lottery side, which I think is, is fascinating because that is a, a Pennsylvania law. I guess we'll see, but he's pushing for an injunction at this point to stop it immediately. All right, well, we'll keep an eye on it. We're going to take a quick break, be back with more Rising after this. Donald Trump's running mate, Senator J.D. Vance, found himself in a fiery back and forth with CNN's Jake Tapper. Tapper challenged Vance on Trump's past remarks on a, quote, enemy from within. People point five percent inflation. the military to go after the enemy within, which is the American people. He did not say that, Jake. The enemy he within? He said that he was going to send the military after the American people. Show me the quote where he, he said, said he was going to. He said the, Amer the enemy within. He said far left lunatics. He's talking like about the people Pelosi's rioting. And he, He's talking about people rioting after the election. I think the Pelosi's we were say, rioting after the election? He said. You're, Adam you're, Schiff you're was rioting after the election? People that don't want the country Adam to succeed. Schiff, he said that Adam Schiff and Nancy Pelosi, he used in a separate context in a separate conversation. And what you're doing is you're smashing Fox, two Fox totally different about conversations. This. Fox asked him about this last week, and he didn't take issue with it. He said the enemy within is the biggest is the biggest but threat to this country. did he say the enemy within, that he's going to use the military against Nancy Pelosi? Donald Trump offered Nancy Pelosi the National Guard on January the 6th. Vance slammed Tapper on claims that Donald Trump is a, quote, fascist. Liz Cheney, he said, should be put before a war tribunal. None of that sounds fascist to, to you at all? No, of course it doesn't. Of Putting course it doesn't. Before a military tribunal? First of all, I don't buy into the premise of what you're saying, Jake, because I just, said. On, on things that These I know that he, he said. said, on things that I know that he said, you're imputing things, you're taking words out of context, you're taking two separate conversations and pretending no, that not. they were made at the exact same no, I'm time. Not. So I'm rejecting the premise of your question. I frankly don't believe what you're saying about Donald Trump's words. If you'd like to put up a clip and actually put him in context, I think the American people would realize that Donald Trump is a hell of a lot more reasonable than the people like Liz Cheney who would like to lie us into war. Now, Jake, we also have to remember, I mean, step back a little bit. Well, ask, ask yourself a basic question about mm -hmm. network integrity. You guys talked about the Russia hoax nonstop. The FBI was investigating talked, it. The FBI talked, was investigating it, and we, so, we, so we covered them. And so you took the words of unnamed FBI agents and put them on your network as if they were the gospel truth. You did it again and again. A viewer of your network would have believed that Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin conspired in 2016. No. That was totally and preposterously false. All right, so there you have it. I mean... I thought he did well. Uh, I'm sure you probably disagree. But um, J.D. Vance, I think, has done a really great job of uh, articulating the Trump vision and also going back against media people who take a lot of the things that he says out of context or, as he put it in this case, smashing two different conversations together to make it sound like he wanted to send the military after Nancy Pelosi, which is not anything that he ever said. And Jake Tapper found himself on defense very, very quickly, especially at the end there when they're talking about the Russian collusion story. CNN covered that wall to wall. They even did some of their own reporting that turned out to be debunked. CNN was the network that reported that Anthony Scaramucci was under investigation, which turned out not to be true. They also were behind the Trump Tower hoax where they said that Michael Cohen was going to testify that Trump knew about the Trump Tower meeting with Russians before it happened. Michael Cohen's own lawyer, Lanny Davis, came out and said that it was not accurate, that they had uh, done misreporting. So Jake Tapper is just wrong to say that CNN was merely just reporting the facts about uh, Russiagate. They were very much involved in advancing that hoax throughout the way and, and reporting on it so breathlessly as to give the impression that it was all true. Well, I mean, Russiagate did happen. It's just whether or not it ha the, the investigation, within the confines of that investigation, it did not follow that investigation's guidelines, but it did happen. There's no denying. I mean, national security agencies have been warning today, including today, that Russia continues to meddle in our elections and push uh, different uh, conversations to boost one candidate over another. With that being said, you know, did it influence the election? I think that's the ultimate question. But um, 
you know, when you watch this interview, J.D. Vance, it, it's very clear that about halfway through, he starts to get caught into this circle about whether or not Donald Trump said the enemies of within comment. And it wasn't two different conversations. Not only was it not two different conversations, Donald Trump repeated it the same day on stage, on stage at MSG. He said it again. And in that initial conversation with Maria Bartiromo on Fox News, he said, quote, there are Marxists and communists and fascists and they're sick. We have China and we have Russia and we have all these countries. If you have a smarter president, they can all be handled. The more difficult you are, you know, the Pelosi's, these people, they're so sick, they're so evil. And he continued to call for um, them the enemy within and radical left, he also suggested that the military would be uh, called in to handle any unrest on election day from radical left lunatics. That was from the Maria Bart Bartiromo interview. That was the Maria Bartiromo interview that aired on Fox News over a week and a half ago. And then he just continued to say it over and over in different contexts. But taking a quote from two weeks later and then another quote from two weeks later doesn't mean that he didn't initially say it. And J.D. Vance is defending something that is on the record. And later that day, Donald Trump said it again. But by the own quote that you just read, he said that the National Guard would be used for unrest, meaning rioters on Election that. Day. He did not That's say that. That was the interpretation. Again. That is not the interpretation. We have an outside enemy. We have an enemy from within. Okay? is more dangerous than China and Russia in these countries, radical left lunatics. We have uh, Nancy Pelosi and, and Adam Schiff. They're Marxists and communists and fascists, and they're sick. I mean, what's so jarring about that? Read the part, keep reading, the part about the National Guard. That they would call in the, 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 the what part? I just read, we read the entire quote. You read a part about sending in the National Guard. The military could be used to handle any unrest on election day from radical left lunatics. But that's not, that's, the that radical left lunatics is not Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic Party. That's my point. He no, he called Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff radical left lunatics and then said we're going to call in the National Guard on radical left lunatics. By the way, that's illegal, number one. That's just straight up illegal. So I'm a radical left lunatic. You're going to call the National Guard on me. And that is why Mark Meadows and Mark Kelly and, and, and uh, so many other military leaders have called him out for this. The quote that you just read did yeah. not have him calling Pelosi and Schiff radical left lunatics. The same sentence of they're Marxists and communists and fascists and they're sick. The more difficult are, you know, the Pelosi's, these people, Adam Schiff, they're so sick and they're so evil. And then keep going to the radical left lunatics. That was just Because that's it. separate. It was the same quote. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just read you the entire quote from start to finish. They're Marxists and communists and fascists and they're sick. We have China, we have Russia, and we have all these countries. If we have a smart president, they can all be handled. The more difficult you are, the difficult are, you know, the Pelosi's, the Schiff's, those people, they're sick and they're so evil. I'll call the National Guard to handle the unrest on election day from radical left lunatics. Is it, is it wrong to send in the National Guard to deal with unrest, meaning riots? But that's not what he said. You just read it. He did not say unrest from riots. He said from radical left lunatics. I mean, that's your interpretation, Amber. But the reality is, is this is not a good look. He keeps repeating it, even being, after being called out, to the point where J.D. Vance, poor J.D. Vance, I didn't think I would feel sorry for anybody. This man has to go on defense and run cover for Donald Trump every time he says in the extreme and then continues to repeat it. But he did not say due to unrest. I do, I do have a question for you because you talk a lot about Trump's rhetoric and how it's dangerous. Do you think it's dangerous to call him a fascist or Hitler? I think the fact, well, first off, I didn't call him Hitler. Uh, I think he's acting as a fascist. And if you look up the definitions of fascism and the rise of fascism, we as a country should be so concerned at this point that this is the kind of rhetoric that is coming out of a former president's mouth and that his own military leaders and staff members Many of whom, by the way, only a couple were fired, and that's the excuse that but they're making. But don't you think it's but a, military it's a, leaders are the ones calling this out? My These point are people are apolitical. My point, Nomiki, is that you say that it's Trump's rhetoric that leads you to call him a fascist, mm -hmm. and that it's Trump's rhetoric that's dangerous. And calling people like Pelosi the enemy within is fascistic and is going to lead to violence against them. Is is it not the same exact thing, and perhaps even worse, to call your political opponent a fascist, or as some Democrats have done, comparing him to Nazis? Well, does that not does that not inspire violence against Donald Trump? You know, maybe you should ask Donald Trump because Donald Trump has continuously called Kamala Harris a fascist over and over and over again. So, you know, if that's the case, maybe ask Donald Trump. Well, I'm not making that case. I'm saying that you say that his rhetoric is leading to violence. 
Yes, it right? Is. It has. January and so, so how is calling him a fascist not the same thing? Because sometimes we have to call things for what they are. It's not a name. It is a thing. It is a principle. There are departments at universities that study fascism and the rise of fascism and the warning signs. And here we are in a moment where there's a major warning sign based on the rhetoric that he's pushing out and his actual actions and Project 2025. There, we have learned from our history. And I think it's very, it's rough. I'm, I'm just curious how you can defend a man who has this rhetoric. He's not your normal Republican. Because I don't buy your interpretation of his comments, for one. And two, I think we, first of all, we have four years of a term that we can go back and look at. Definitely. So I guess what I'm getting at here, my problem is, if you truly believe that Donald Trump is a fascist and that if he gets power again, he's never going to leave office because said you that. said that to me before. Well, he said that. Okay. He want to be president for life. He said that. Was if that another you, joke? If you truly believe that, mm -hmm. would you not be justified in killing him to prevent him from getting into office. What? If you truly believe that Trump is going to seize power for eternity, for the rest of his life, and turn America into a fascist dictatorship, why, what would you stop at to prevent him from getting into office? Well, I believe in democracy, and I think that the voters will stop him, but we have the right to call it but out what if they don't? for what it is. We have the right to call it out for what it is. If he breaks the law, as fascists do, we have a system of government that holds him accountable, checks and balances. But furthermore, if he believes that Kamala Harris is a fascist, let's use your same logic on but that But if one. you think that he's going to suspend the Constitution or terminate the Constitution, Which then said. the then those checks and balances wouldn't exist. So what would you stop at to stop Donald Trump? I believe in democracy, and I believe in rule of law. <coughs> That's going to do it for us today on Rising. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any content. And for those of you who like to listen on the go, we are now available anywhere you listen to podcasts.